Margaret Sinclair, Vocation. You remember, Father, I came to you before about breaking off my engagement, said Margaret to the priest, who was trying to recollect where he had seen her before. So it was you, was it? I remember now. I understand why you were so anxious to break it off. A quiet, happy smile and a bashful look of gratitude reassured the priest that Margaret Sinclair was a genuinely solid girl, as he went on to ask her, And so you want to be a nun, and what kind of nun? A poor Clare whispered the girl, But mother may object, father. My sister Bella is going away, and my brother Andrew is going to Canada, so it will be pretty hard for mother all alone. Are there no others at home? Oh, yes, there is Lizzie and Lawrence, but they are young yet, and Mother wants comforting sometimes. Well, we'll see about that later. Just tell me why you want to be a nun instead of marrying. You know marriage is a great sacrament. It typifies the union of our Lord and his church. Margaret's face lit up as she smiled in the fullness of her inmost joy and happiness. Oh yes, Father, marriage is a great sacrament, but I want to be with our Lord alone. But child, a poor Claire's life is hard. They never take meat. They do not sleep on a bed. It is a life of penance and suffering. I know, Father, I want to suffer with our Lord, and if he gives me the grace, I am quite strong and can bear it. Do you know anything about the vows? said the priest, as he went on to explain how this imitation of Christ, our Lord, is carried out by the three vows which not only guarantee the keeping of the commandments, but also run counter to the evil inclinations of our nature, which tempt us to break them. Poverty, to counteract all greed. Chastity, to check sensuality. Obedience, to crush pride. There is also another way of looking at it. A nun becomes, as it were, wedded to our divine Lord himself, and as he was poor, she too tries to be poor like him, and pure too, and obedient, even unto death. Does this appeal to you, or is it not too hard? With our Lord's help, it will not be too hard, replied the girl, smiling. Then the priest inquired about her health, spiritual life, temptations, etc. It became evident that Margaret had been speaking from experience. She rose early to be in time for the seven o'clock mass at St. Patrick's every day. She received Holy Communion, making her thanksgiving for a little time after the mass, and then went straight to her work at Robinson Avenue. She was a French polisher and had been several years with the same firm, working steadily from eight in the morning till six in the evening. She took no breakfast, neither did she take any peace with her, fasting all the time. The hour's break at midday she spent before the Blessed Sacrament at St. Peter's all St. Cuthbert's, Slatford. When she came home, she would help her mother to prepare dinner for father and the rest of the family. For Margaret was always trying to do something for ye fray her youngest days, as her mother would say. Then she would sit to dinner with all the family, making little acts of self-denial and eating sparingly. Dinner over, she would help to tidy up everything and hurry off to St. Patrick's for another visit to the Blessed Sacrament or else to the sewing class 
at the helpers of the holy souls. She said the rosary at home, kneeling before her wee altar. Then she made a little cross for herself, well finished and neatly polished, with seven sharp nails projecting on one side. She wore this cross next to the skin on the small of her back, just to counteract that way of walking arm round the waist, which is common among working girls in Edinburgh, as well as to suffer something for her dear Lord. Father, remarked Mrs. R to the priest later, I used to pat her on the back every time I saw her. I never knew she wore that cross. The priest was satisfied. He recommended a novena to Our Lady and the little flower. At the end of the novena, she was to interview the Mother Abbess at Liberton. Meanwhile, she was to take a good breakfast every day and leave the crosses till our Lord would send his own, in his own way and in his own time. She must save up strength for his sake. Her implicit obedience and trust in God's assistance deepened the priest's conviction that her vocation was indeed genuine. The novena was over. Mother Abbas told Margaret that she had a vocation, but that there was no room at Liberton. However, there was sure to be a place in London if the priest would write. She had been faithful to his instructions. The priest promised to write, and told Margaret to write herself in all simplicity, telling Mother Abbas the reasons of her desires. After a few days, the priest received a long letter from Mother Abbas in London, in which she showed herself satisfied with the sincerity and simplicity of Margaret's wish to enter the convent, and requested the priest to explain to her the severity of the life which she would have to undergo, and to ask her to go to a reliable medical man for a thorough examination as to her physical fitness for such an austere life. He sent for Margaret and explained the details of a poor Claire's life to her. Poor fare, rough clothing, humble work, scant sleep, hard penances, and above all, and through all, absolute docility towards superiors as to Christ our Lord himself. Does this frighten you? inquired the priest. With God's help, it will be all right, smiled the girl, scarcely containing her joy. Just one more difficulty. Margaret told the priest that perhaps she should not go yet, for her sister Bella was going to the little sisters of the poor, and Andrew, her brother, would be off to Canada shortly. She was afraid the separation would be too severe for her mother. She might get one of those fits of depression which she dreaded so much. Should she not stay back and comfort her and then go away herself? The priest, however, was not of that opinion. No, child, you just ask, mother, and if she agrees, then say nothing more and go. If she seems disturbed, then let me know. In any case, I will keep in touch with her and help her while you are away. The priest's surmise was correct. It would be easier for Margaret to go now than later on. It would be easier for her parents to make one big sacrifice now than a series of smaller sacrifices in succession. His knowledge of Mrs. Sinclair, Margaret's mother, proved to be correct. She was glad to offer up her daughters to her Lord and God. However much, she would miss their company 
and their loyal assistance. When Margaret brought the good news that her mother had shown no sign of displeasure or annoyance, but was only overjoyed at the thought, saying, I'll give the whole lot to him. The priest noticed that Margaret had a slight cough. He advised her to go for a fortnight to the convalescent hospital managed by the Sisters of Charity at Lanark, and afterwards to consult Dr. R.J., a well-known Catholic medical man in Edinburgh. She was to tell him the reason of her visit, viz. to know whether she was fit for the life of a poor Clare in London. Meanwhile, she was to do no penance, obedience only. No sooner said than done, Margaret gave notice to her employer, who was distressed at the idea of losing her services. She had worked faithfully. He would increase her wages. She could go for a holiday, and he would keep her place vacant for her. He could not understand why she wanted to leave. Still, Margaret could only smile as she repeated that she would not come back again. Then she went to Lanark and was quite happy for a while, living quite near to her divine Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Last but not least, Dr. R.J. had examined her thoroughly and certified her as perfectly sound and quite fit even for a poor Claire's austere life. All preparations being now ready, Margaret called at the priest's house for his blessing, bringing her brother Andrew with her, who was on his way to Canada. Taking their sister Bella, they went to London on the 21st July, 1923. Next morning, Margaret was received as a postulant at the convent of the Poor Clares, Ladbrook Grove, Cornwall Road, London, W11, having first received Holy Communion with her brother Andrew for the last time.